Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Ajay Swami, and I am a product leader with Amazon Web Services. At AWS specifically, um, I am part of the AWS Solutions Group, um, where I manage various solutions and products that we build towards our customer segments. Um, within our worldwide customer segments team, my focus is on small and medium businesses, greenfield enterprises, DNBs, ISVs, uh, digital native businesses, independent software vendors, and startups. So I build and deliver various products and solutions for all of these segments um, across the world. I'm glad to have you with me today because today we're going to be discussing something that's really important uh, for you as a product leader or a product manager. It's about measuring what matters in your product. Without measuring, um, you can't improve your product. Without measuring, you cannot iterate. And without measuring, you don't necessarily understand where to actually focus your investments. So today we'll be chatting a lot about how to actually set up metrics for your product and then really sort of become outcome driven and metrics driven so you can have a more productive and efficient working mechanism so to actually impact the lives of your customers. So today's agenda is focused on these five topics. The first topic is around being more outcome driven versus output driven. We'll dig a little bit more into why that is important. Uh, the second is about determining the right product metrics for your product and your organization and sort of how to recognize which ones to use um, versus others. Here specifically, we'll talk about vanity versus clarity metrics um, and where they are useful. Next, we'll talk about setting up the right pro pro product metrics from the get-go, um, where we'll take a top-down approach um, and then apply that to across the different product features or different product areas where you'll be measuring different product areas and their outcomes and how they sort of roll up to your one um, North Star metric. And then lastly, we'll be talking about OKRs and KPIs um, and how you sort of measure those. And then we'll wrap up with communication. Um, by the way, if you don't communicate, all of the work that you do in terms of measuring your product metrics, it's not really that useful. You gotta measure your you gotta measure your metrics, and you gotta celebrate your successes. All right. So with that said, let's get started. Okay. So let's talk about being outcome driven. So in order to be outcome driven, uh, you need to sort of get into the mindset of what is really impactful for your customer. So Marty Kagan, the founder of Silicon Valley Product Group, he championed the term empower product team versus a feature product team. Um, across many organizations today, uh, you know, product teams are broken up into feature product teams where PMs manage uh, one to many different features for, uh, for a product suite. However, um, you know, what the work that goes out there is, is around being able to talk with the field, being able to talk with your customers, and then understanding their pain points and opportunities for improvement, and, and being able to, you know, design features, build those features, and releasing those features to solve for that pain point. But is that really outcome driven? No, that's that's more output driven. So so let's let's sort of walk through a very simple example. So let's imagine um, you're at work. You're exhausted. Um, it's afternoon after lunch, um, and you're feeling tired, right? It's it's the afternoon blues. So you go to the cafe next door, um, and you buy yourself coffee. At the coffee shop itself, um, you know, to some people, the outcome of the event is the coffee, and the output was you walking to the coffee store, um, picking out the coffee that you want, paying for it, and then getting your coffee. Also, the output could also be all of the work that went in at the coffee shop to actually produce the coffee. And, you know, some people just walk away with that as the measure of output and the measure of a product. But that's not really, really complete. The outcome is not really the, the outcome is not really the coffee. The outcome is that you feel more energized and you're able to feel more productive in the late afternoon and you can sort of get to all of the tasks that you need to get done. The outcome is the way in which your problem was solved by the output. Now, if you sort of plug that 
um, that mindset, the mental model into a product, it really impacts how you sort of define product metrics. So for example, um, if you focus on product measurement from an output perspective, the number of features delivered, the number of bugs fixed, that's not really outcome driven, that's more output driven. Um, by focusing on outcomes, for example, let's assume um, that you own an e-commerce product and you have various features within that e-commerce product. And one of the outcomes that you want is, hey, I want to reduce my cart abandonment rate. So you as a PM can actually dictate that specific objective to your product team that's responsible for looking at the shopping experience all the way uh, through checkout, right? And using that as an objective or a goal, you can create that autonomy and allow the team to find the best design, the best builds, the best solution to actually accomplish that goal. And that might take one or more iterations, right? You're not going to get this right the first time. But nonetheless, you're able to at least look at that objectively and say, hey, is my cart abandonment rate going up or is it going down? And how do we get to improve on it? That is being outcome driven. By being outcome focused, it'll also help you become more customer focused because you are really sort of focusing on what problem you're solving for the customer, right? What are the jobs to be done by the customer and how well they're accomplishing those jobs to be done? Is it making them more efficient? Is it really solving their pain point? Or are they just sort of going through the motions because there's no other alternative? If you look at it from that perspective, you're really sort of laying the foundation to become more customer obsessed and building the right pro building the right set of features that result in the best outcomes for your customer. So moving on, um, let's talk about determining the right product metrics. Um, you have to recognize which metrics are more applicable to a particular situation. Um, to me, the way I've always looked at metrics is across these two broad buckets. Um, on the left-hand side is something called vanity metrics, and on the right-hand side is something called actionable metrics. You can also uh, you can also hear people talk about actionable metrics as clarity metrics. So sort of let's go through um, what the um, what the differences are between both of these metrics and where it's applicable. So when you look at vanity metrics, they are generally good for understanding the size of the business, right? They're sort of understanding, it's good for you to understand how many people are aware of your product. But they're not really good at, good at for you to understand whether your product has a good product market fit uh, or whether um, how many customers have really adopted your product. However, if you look at actionable metrics or clarity metrics, they are really good indicators um, that you have a strong product market fit. And they can also tell you very quickly that your product market fit is improving or you're losing it as, as um, a result of you know, releasing bad features or other uh, new entrants into the market. So uh, when you look at vanity metrics, like I said before, uh, they sort of help you determine the size of the business, right? These are sort of the metrics that talk about gross quantities. Um, you, you can track them pretty easily, right? So if you look at uh, usage analytics, for example, you can look at the page visits, you can look at followers. Um, you can also look at, if you have an app, you can look at the number of times that apps have been downloaded. Um, you can look at the total customers acquired, total revenues, et cetera. This is really good um, when you want to understand how your product is sort of moving in a certain direction um, and how you want to scale it. So for example, like if you're not getting a whole bunch of users to your website, um, then obviously, you know, that's not really good because you can't scale number one because you can't convert. However, um, when you look at actionable metrics, you know, they are really representative of how a particular customer segment is behaving. They'll, you know, it, you can sort of really sort of drill down and understand the personas that are impacted, the segments that are impacted, and it helps you sort of understand that through the lens of uh, ratios and unit economics. So for example, um, you can look at conversion rate um, and you can see how that's trending. Uh, you can look at the customer acquisition cost for CAC 
and see what's happening there, right? Um, because ideally, you want that CAC to reduce um, over a period of time, either through referrals or word of mouth or the strong network effects. If that's not happening, then you know that you're not probably getting a stronger product market fit as you mature. Uh, there's other things such as churn rate, uh, customer lifetime value, um, NPS, et cetera. So clarity metrics sort of really, really help you understand whether your product is doing the right thing for your customer. And vanity metrics sort of help you understand, okay, like how, what is the size of, of my product that's being impacted across the space where it operates? So really sort of understand which ones to use when. Um, and sometimes, by the way, what I like to do is use vanity metrics um, as a precursor to clarity metrics. So for example, I like to understand the number of visitors uh, or the number of downloads um, and see how that trends. And I like to sort of tie that into the conversion rate and see if there's a correlation there. So think about it in terms of vanity and clarity metrics and make sure that you apply the right set of criteria for your product uh, to under better understand the problems that you solve for your customers. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, within your product organization, if you haven't done this before, that's quite okay. Um, if your practices are ad hoc and, and you're measuring some parts of your product, but not others, that's okay as well. Um, it's never too late to actually sort of set up um, something more structured with your product organization. Um, and the way to do that is, is sort of what, what I have here on the slide. So you wanna create a holistic top-down view of what you think success constitutes. So starting off, you know, you want to look at your North Star metric. Your North Star metric, um, or NSM for short, it should really be your focus to track your company and your product's growth. It's singularly the most important leading metric that allows you to quickly align and your team around your company and your company around your product. And it sort of brings you focus, clarity, and um and sort of um customer for uh, customer focus around what problem what problems you're solving for them so um if you look at some of the examples in the market today um if you look at spotify you know their north star metric could be something as something as simple as time spent listening why does that matter because the more time you spend spend on spotify uh, the more uh revenues they generate for their artists uh, the more ads that are shown in case you are a freemium user um, and the more value that you get as a customer, right? So it's not just music. They're interested across podcasts, shows, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's a pretty good North Star metric. Um, Facebook could, could be something as uh, daily active users or monthly active users. Daily active users, I'm a little skeptical of because it varies a lot. Um, you want to be able to set up a North Star metric that's not as that's that's not um that's not sort of thrown off by periods right so a monthly active user uh, metric is is a good north star metric to measure airbnb experiences for example that could be the number of booked experiences so there's various ways to sort of corral your team around the right north star metric and then being able to say hey you know what this actually makes sense for us to understand if we're moving in the right direction second um you should be very aware of your feature metrics. Feature metrics generally act as input metrics and they sort of roll up into your North Star metric. They should materially impact your North Star metric. If it does not move your North Star metric, start to rethink whether this particular feature metric is really the one that you should be tracking. So let's go back to our previous example for Spotify. Uh, for Spotify, you know, time spent listening um, can be impacted by various other sub-metrics or input metrics. So, for example, you know, you could track how frequent the users come back to the app um, and start listening. Um, can, can we do something there to build and, you know, enforce that behavior to use Spotify more? Um, that could poten potentially be an outcome-focused objective uh, for one of your product teams that focused that, that's focused on um, customer conversion and customer retention, right? Uh, so that, that that's one area where, where you could influence that. 
Second, it could be increasing per session listen times. As you sort of understand your customer behaviors, are there areas where you can say, hey, I think I understand the customer's behavior. I think I understand where this person uses Spotify during what times. And I think I'll be able to either recommend or enhance the experience of the customer during this time so they can actually listen more. Um, so again, this kind of outcome-driven objectives will actually give your product teams um, autonomy over how they actually try and try and achieve that objective. Um, so that's 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 a couple of different examples about how your feature metrics actually sort of roll up into your North Star metric and then sort of help you become more outcome driven. Um, so um, again, empower your feature product managers. Um, make sure they understand what the North Star metric is and make sure you understand and work with them uh, to ensure that, um, to make sure that you are defining the right metrics that roll up into the North Star metric. So th this is great, right? You've, you've done your work, you've identified your North Star metric, you've identified your feature metrics, you have a good pyramid um, that, you know, you have the underlying metrics that roll up to your North Star metric. However, that's only half the battle, right? Um, the second half is actually sort of being able to put, put that into work continuously. At Amazon, for example, right? We have, we measure everything, right? We measure um, uh, deployments, we measure page visits, we measure vanity metrics, we measure clarity metrics, but we also sort of are very thoughtful about when to actually act. So we have monthly product sessions or monthly uh, product meetings. We have quarterly product meetings. And then we sort of look at all of these identifying metrics and we actually set goals at the beginning of the year to hit certain, um, to hit certain, um, certain objectives. And then we get to sort of measure month over month, quarter over quarter, how we're doing and what those metrics are telling us. So we can be very thoughtful about assessing where we need to improve and where that investment needs to go, either um, from a quarter from a quarterly perspective or a monthly perspective, and then we can figure out what to change in terms of our product or our feature. So in a nutshell, when you sort of identify the metrics, make sure you capture those metrics, make sure you analyze that at a frequency that matches your particular use case, um, act on those metrics, monitor again, and then repeat. Um, if you do those things, you'll start to see um, a gradient where you'll get to see a product improve over time and customer experience also improve over time. Another key area um, is around utilizing OKRs and KPIs. Now, you as a product uh, manager within your organization, you might probably not have um, the capability um, or the remit to actually set up these OKRs or KPIs. But if you do, it really makes sense from a product organization perspective to align with your uh, senior leadership teams to establish some of these OKRs and KPIs. So what are OKRs? Um, OKRs, they stand for objective and key results. Um, and they really sort of think about it as providing the missing link between ambition and reality. They sort of help you break out of the status quo um, and then help you achieve these objectives um, um, in terms of how you want to achieve a particular goal. So OKRs um, are short qualitative descriptions of what you're trying to achieve. Um, and the key results are accompanying each objective uh, and they quantify the metrics that help you measure that progress. Now, let's, let's talk about KPIs, right? OKRs encompass key performance indicators. They are inclusive of KPIs. They measure how you're performing to achieve those key results defined in your objective above. So really sort of the main differences between OKRs and KPIs um, lies in their um, purpose, their scope, uh, their duration, 
um, and how you sort of measure them, right? So let's let's take a simple example here. For example, um, your objective to be could be, hey, I want to get back in shape after the holidays. This is your destination. This is your goal, right? It answers the question, where do I want to go? Where do I want to be? The key result is I want to decrease my body fat by 5%. This is a mechanism that tells you whether you're actually getting closer to your goal, right? Because if you cannot measure, you cannot succeed, right? Uh, how do you know you're actually getting there? So decreasing your body fat is within your circle of influence, um, but you don't have full control over it. But how do you know that you are actually getting to achieve that key result? Well, you can measure it, right? And this is what key KPIs are for. So KPIs can track, you know, um, the number of miles you walk per week, the weights you're lifting, how many times you're going to the gym, the time per mile, is that increasing or decreasing? Uh, but they might not directly correlate to your key results because you need to measure those key results. Um, but it at least tells you exactly whether you are headed in the right direction or in the wrong direction. So, you know, think through these from a perspective of an organization uh, top down, right? So, if you are able to define an objective for your organization or for your product org, um, think about it from a perspective of what the goal should be and what those key results are that, that actually helps you think about whether you're achieved that goal. And then you can start to define specific performance indicators that help you achieve those key results. Um, if you can do that, um, I think you'll be in a better place. Uh, because all of these things are the tools and the mechanisms that helps you achieve greater product market fit or greater customer satisfaction. All right, so this this brings us to um, another part um, of the metrics discussion. So there's other types of metrics um, that you utilize, right? Um, and they sort of broadly fall into three different areas. Proxy metrics, counter metrics, and then leading and lagging indicators. So, what are proxy metrics? Um, the, the short answer is that proxy metrics, um, they help you, they exist to help you determine whether your particular hypothesis uh, will improve the high, will improve a high level engagement metric within your product. Um, proxy metrics are generally more easy to measure and optimize. Um, and they change more frequently. So for example, um, if you look at conversion rate or if you look at registration rates, these are probably proxy metrics um, that says, hey, your product actually has a good value proposition and people like registering or using your product because they're converting. However, it's not really a stand-in to say, hey, is the product actually doing a good job from an outcome perspective, right? Is it really sort of, um, helping the customer achieve their jobs to be done? Is it really sort of achieving um, the customer's objectives? We don't know that, but at least it tells you directionally that you're on the right track. Um, the second metric, which is actually very useful to measure, and I alluded that to, alluded uh, to this earlier, is counter metrics. Um, and the key to this is that you want to pair metrics with counter metrics for balancing. So for example, you can pair the growth of your product with quality metrics. What does that mean? So you can you can probably see that your conversion rates have increased. A lot of people have been registering for your product um, and that shows interest on your product. However, let's assume you survey those people uh, via NPS and you realize the NPS is really poor. So these are counter metrics. And then you get to start to understand deeply why that is the case that's happening, where you know, on the surface, the product's value proposition might be very, very strong, and that's why people convert. Um, but as you start to use your product, that quickly fades away. And also, another um, good example is about you know, web traffic and conversion rate. You know, a higher web traffic to your website or your product page or your landing page does not necessarily relate to a higher conversion rate, right? So you can, you can start to see 
how those two work in tandem together um, and can start to optimize for uh, the right shortcomings. Um, the third uh, um, metric um, is are basically, they're called leading or lagging indicators. Um, and these are super uh, useful. La lagging indicators already tell you what's happened. And the leading indicators can sort of point you to future success or future friction in your product. So within Amazon or within AWS, I should say, um, we track both, right? Um, when we have our monthly business reviews or our quarterly business reviews, what we are actually tracking are lagging indicators. We get to, we get to look at revenues. We get to look at um, how many customers have used the product. We get to look at other kinds of metrics that tell us what's already happened. However, leading indicators can also sort of help us understand whether we are on the path to growth or whether on the path to decline. So some of the key examples here are profit, revenue, et cetera. They're all lagging indicators because that, that's already happened. However, if you start to look at a trend in growth in the number of signups or the number of registration, that can potentially sort of help you to help you tell a different story, which is, hey, you know what? People are interested and that might lead to greater sales. Um, that might not always be the case, but it tells you that you're sort of moving in the right direction. So be thoughtful about what kind of metrics you want to use and how you want to measure them. Um, proxies can help you sort of uncover um, and optimize so for some of the deeper level attributes, uh, behavioral attributes that you might not be able to directly measure, but it helps sort of get you in the right direction. Counter metrics sort of helps you tell a different story and help you sort of double check yourself whether you're moving in the right direction. The example that I used earlier was around conversion rates and NPS, right? Big, you know, a growth in conversion rates doesn't necessarily mean that the customer is fully satisfied with using your product. And then leading and lagging indicators sort of tell you where you've already been, where the, what the product has already achieved versus what is the potential for your product to achieve? Um, so all of these things are very, very useful um, and be thoughtful about how you use them. So this brings us to the end. Um, so it, it's not just enough about, you know, with measuring your product. You have to communicate the value of the product it has had on your organization. And better yet, it's, it's if you can sort of tell the story from the perspective of the impact on the customer. Um, metrics are a tool for you to celebrate your wins, right? It's not enough just measuring and improving. But you have to sort of, um, you know, take some time to reflect um, and give credit where credit is due to the PMs, to the product team, to your engineering team, uh, to your design team, to the sales teams, um, and the product ecosystem, because you're all in this together, right? So make sure you understand that, and then make sure you make some time to celebrate those wins. And then lastly, you know, highlight you as a PM, you have to highlight your positive impact on the organization and the impact um, of your product team, right? Make sure you have um, sessions such as state of the product. Um, during the state of the product, you can get to talk about, you know, the wins and the successes you've had with your product, but also acknowledge that there are other areas to improve. This tells the bar organization what's happening with your product, how you're what your um, key successes are, uh, where are the areas to improve, and what's upcoming, right? So make sure you always take some time to measure, to analyze, to celebrate, and always improve. So get building, make sure you work with your teams to figure out what the best metrics to measure are, um, and then, you know, always improve. Uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out for me uh, to advise uh, for advice. I'm on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Um, I will the product school will also be sharing this deck um, after this uh, webinar. Um, and I hope this was useful. Um, so happy building and uh, uh, have a great day, everybody.